Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for March 8th, 2020. We are we began a new unit uh, last Sunday, uh, Unit 1 for the spring quarter, uh, which is entitled, God Requires Justice. This is from the Faith uh, Pathway Adult Quarterly and also the Standard Commentary, God Requires Justice is our unit title, and we're in Lesson 2 for the quarter from the Faith Pathway uh, Adult Quarterly. The lesson title is Ending Injustice. Ending Injustice. Our devotional reading comes from Psalm 73, verses 1 to 3, and then verses 21 to 28. Our background scripture is Habakkuk chapter 1. And our printed and lesson text is taken from Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and then 12 to 14. Our lesson aims from the quarterly or number 1, explain the justice of God in contrast to present human injustice. Number two, aspire to aid in the establishment of justice and fairness for all. And number three, celebrate God as the source and model of justice. From the Standard Commentary, our lesson title is A Prayer for Justice. Additional aims or number one, summarize Habakkuk's two complaints. Number two, explain the specific issue of justice which Habakkuk was wrestling. And then number three, watch and pray to see how God is working in difficult situations this week. Uh, we have uh, two lessons, each of which have our, actually we're using two commentaries, I should say, uh, each of which have two major divisions from the quarterly. The first division is a perplexed prophet. That's covered between chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Second division is questioning God's plan. That's covered between Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 and 14. From the standard, our first division is dilemma. Covered between verses 1 to 4. And the second is deliberations. Covered between verses 12 to 14. Before we read our lesson text, let's just go before the throne. Have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank and praise you for blessing us throughout this day, Lord. In so many seen and unseen ways, Lord. We thank you for your loving kindness always and your tender mercy. We thank you for another opportunity to study your precious word. And Lord, we pray that you give us a greater understanding of your word. Help us to understand, Lord, your judgment, Lord, uh, as much as we can receive, Lord. We know that your thoughts are higher than ours, as the heavens are higher than the earth, Lord. But we, we know that this is a question that the prophets of old wrestled with, and we wrestle with it today, Lord. How the evil seem to, to flourish while the righteous suffer, Lord. But we know, Lord, that in the end, that you will settle all accounts. And we just ask for your blessings, Lord, upon all the hearers of this lesson today. And again, we pray as we un always, as we understand your word better, that our faith would be increased. And as our faith is increased, that our obedience to your word would be increased. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we read our lesson text, uh, let me give a little background. Habakkuk, uh, and this is the second uh, lesson in a series of four that uh, are basically taken from what are commonly referred to as minor prophets for the 12 minor prophets. Not minor because of the importance of their writings, but simply the, the volume of their writings compared to uh, the more voluminous writings of uh, what are called the major prophets, those being uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, uh, those are major prophets just by virtue of the volume of their writings. Uh, very little is known about Habakkuk, and what is known 
uh, is uh, basically what can be understood from what is in the the book uh, called by his name. Uh, it appears that he was a prophet uh, to Judah, of course, and a contemporary of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zephaniah in the latter part of the 7th century. Actually, uh, we know that uh, it was after uh, the, uh, Babylon had become a world power, which means it was after 612 B.C. when Babylon, when Babylon overthrew Nineveh. Uh, they had been in subjection to the Assyrians who had, in 722 uh, B.C., we know, uh, captured the northern kingdom uh, and took them into captivity or scattered them. Uh, the Babylonians had grown in power gradually until they were able to uh, defeat the Assyrians uh, the capital city being Nineveh in, six, in 612. Uh, later, uh, and they actually pursued uh, the king to Haran and, uh, uh, in 609 B.C., and then later to uh, Carp, Car it's actually pronounced Carchemish, Carchemish, and uh, there they defeated uh the Pharaoh Nico uh, in 605 BC. So this this uh, must have happened. Uh, Habakkuk must have prophesied uh, somewhere between uh, 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 612, uh, perhaps a little before. Again, as um, as Babylon was becoming the world power, perhaps after they had defeated the Assyrians. Also, it it was after the reign of Josiah, who was, as you may recall, a godly king. Uh, he really uh, instituted major reforms, uh, and um, that really uh, began in like 622 B.C. Um, unfortunately, uh, he was killed resisting Pharaoh Necho and the uh, the fleeing king of Assyria uh, in 605 B.C. at that battle of Carchemish. Uh, and so it was sometime between uh, the, the time that uh, he died and uh, and actually uh, that, that means that it was perhaps uh, right around the time that he died because we know that uh, Judah quickly reverted to their sinful ways under uh, uh, under Josiah's successor Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim, in uh, and that we see that in Jeremiah twenty two thirteen to to nineteen. Um, with that as background, uh, the the main issue, if you will, uh, that uh, Habakkuk covers is the the sin that Habakkuk was a witness to. Again, uh, Judah had uh, quickly reverted back to the sins of, of Ammon, uh, who was um, uh, Josiah's grandfather, and uh, and they uh, were committing all manner of sin, which Habakkuk describes um, uh, briefly between verses 1 to 4, and he's questioning how God can allow this unrighteousness to continue, how he can allow the, uh, the righteous to be uh, persecuted, uh, the weak and the poor to be uh, set upon by the, the powerful and the, and the uh, unjust, uh, and there was no justice here, justice, the those who were in authority to uh, provide justice were perverted. Uh, and so and so he is questioning God, how a righteous God could allow this to go on uh, with impunity, apparent impunity. And so God answers him 
Uh, and he is more perplexed after he receives the answer that God gives them as to what he's going to do about the unrighteousness in Judah. And we know that uh, shortly after uh, this prophecy, uh, what God uh, in had intended to do, had prophesied through Jeru uh, through Jeremiah, even even so far back as Isaiah, uh, and that was to use the Babylonians to, uh, to judge Judah uh, is going to happen. Again, that began in 605 B.C., right after the Battle of Carchemish. They uh, Nebuchadnezzar proceeded on to Judah. Uh, ultimately, and he actually made three raids into Judah, ultimately in 586 during the last raid, the temple was leveled, the palaces, the walls were leveled and burned, and the all of the remaining uh, people of any value were taken captive. So with that as background, and I know that was a lot, uh, let's read the first portion of our lesson text, the first four verses, verses one to four. And they are the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth for the wicked doth compass ab about the righteous wherefore or I'm sorry therefore wrong judgment proceedeth so let's uh, back up to verse 1 uh, and this uh, this section of the lesson from the again from the Quarterly is a perplexed prophet. He has just uh, really explained his confusion uh, or what he's confused about. And then from the standard, this section is entitled The Dilemma. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Uh, this word burden is translated from the Hebrew word a Hebrew word that can refer to loads carried by by animals. It, it's very commonly used uh, to introduce uh, prophetic messages uh, that are threatening or ominous in nature, and uh, it it is something that has to be said, even because it's weighing so heavily on the prophet's mind, and that's why it's referred to as a burden. He must speak them in order to relieve himself of the burden that he feels. Uh, so this burden, it says the burden which, pro which Habakkuk the prophet did see, and then it goes on to, uh, to begin a prayer, it looks like, that Habakkuk offers before the Lord, or he is simply asking the Lord questions here. Oh Lord, verse 2a, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? So he is uh, crying out about something to the Lord. And when he says, how long shall I cry? It indicates that, you know, this is, this is something that uh, he's voiced his concern about repeatedly uh, for some time now. And he has not heard from the Lord. Now, prophets... As you might imagine, uh, in order to speak for the Lord, have to hear from the Lord. The Lord actually tells them what to say, and in many cases, uh, what to think about what he said. But in this case, uh, he's asking the Lord a question, and he has not heard an answer from the Lord. Now, the Lord um, certainly hears Habakkuk, and the prophet knows that. I mean, the prophet... Uh, Habakkuk probably fears that the only explanation for God's lack of concern or him not uh, answering him is uh, is that he is choosing to ignore him. He is choosing 
Uh, certainly he hears him, but he's choosing to ignore him. And so really the question is, how long are you going to ignore me, Lord? Um, because we know that he hears him. Part B of verse 2 says, Even cry out the of violence, and thou wilt not save. So he's crying to the Lord about violence that's going on. Uh, and probably it's rampant. And we know something about that in our society today with uh, mass shootings and drive-by uh, killings and, and black-on-black crime, the gangland-style uh, killings. We know something about violence in our day. But we know also that, and as, as a backer does, that God really hates violence. Uh, in fact, from the very beginning of the Bible, near the very beginning, in chapter 6, uh, beginning at verse 11, the Lord uh, expresses his disdain for it. It said, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And then we know that God goes on and calls Noah to build an ark. Uh, verse 13 says, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them, uh, I will destroy them with the earth. So he is, uh, we know that he abhors violence, which is all the more reason uh, Habakkuk is perplexed here as to why God is allowing it in, Ju in Judah to be so prevalent in Judah. Verse 3a, why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? Again, uh, he is asking God, uh, well, not a rhetorical question, but he knows God hears him and God is choosing to ignore him for some reason, uh, only known to God at this point. So this verse also, it, this half verse, uh, 3a, introduces uh, two, two of uh, the six words Habakkuk is going to use to describe the chaos that he sees everywhere he turns uh, in Judah. And this chaos, of course, uh, of course, is something that God abhors. It stands in opposition to the order that God desires and has desired from Genesis chapter 1. Uh, so, so, so in his questions, again, uh, Habakkuk is asking why the Lord hasn't done something about this. Certainly he knows that God sees this violence. So let's go on to part B, 3B says, for spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. So these are the, the remaining four words that describe the chaos, spoiling. And that that's a word that's associated with with taking something by force, sometimes warfare, but but taking a plunder from others. Uh, violence again. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, is 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 uh, just brute a brutalization of people. Uh, sometimes uh, this is used in a war context, but probably in this context, it's just violence in the streets. It's violence of the strong against the weak. It's just thuggery, strife and contention. And these are, uh, of course, you know, if you take these these together, uh, they they uh, really describe uh, the, 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 the struggle between perhaps those who are trying to live decently, trying to do right, and those who are probably overpowering them with, with evil and chaos and discord. Let's move on to verse 4a. It says, Therefore the law is slack. Now, this Habakkuk telling God that the law is slack, what does he mean by that? Uh, he means that the law is, is made feeble uh, or weak, uh, it's 
it's essentially inactive or lifeless because it's not being observed and no, no one is enforcing it. As I said earlier, uh, it appears that those who are in a th- who are in authority to uh, to execute the law and judgment uh, to keep, uh, to to make sure that people abide by it are perverted, and they are probably uh, perpetuating this this violence and this chaos uh, by their lack of of discipline and and and, and lack of concern for control. Part B, of verse four says. And judgment doth not go forth. What do you mean by that? Uh, he says judgment, you know, that's associated with justice uh, in many cases. Uh, it's a similar concept. Uh, he's saying it's powerless. Justice is powerless in the society. And there are a number of uh, verses here that we could refer to. Uh, for comparison, Jeremiah twenty two fifteen, uh, and then twenty three five, and then Ezekiel uh, forty five nine as well. These are are verses that describe similar situations. Again, or or maybe I haven't said, but Habakkuk's dilemma was not uncommon. Uh, several of the prophets, and certainly those uh, that he was contemporary with express the same concerns. Uh, we know that Amos uh, actually uh, was a was the prophet uh, that uh, prophesied some years before uh, Habakkuk did, but he expressed a desire that that God's judgment uh, uh, and his righteousness flow like a mighty stream. And we know we we read that in last week's lesson, and 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 certainly uh, it was because of the unrighteousness uh, that he was experiencing in his day, and that was before the northern kingdom fell. Part four C says, "For the wicked doth com- compass me about." I'm sorry, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous, the wicked appear to be in control when it says composite means they surround me they're they're all around me and they are suppressing uh, any efforts of the righteous uh, anything that they want to express concerns about or being snuffed out by the wicked Uh, and then part d of verse four says therefore wrong judgments proceedeth Wrong judgment proceeds. What's he talking about there? He's talking about uh, uh, the per- perverted judgment uh, is happening there. Uh, there's no. That's the norm uh, for justice to be really injustice. Now this is this is really contrary to what God intended. In fact. Uh, before the children of Israel went in to possess the land, uh, of course, Moses spoke to them in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 to 20. Uh, it reads, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest or twist judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take gift, a gift rather, or a bribe. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and the pervert, and pervert the word of the righteous. And, and verse 20, that which is altogether just shalt thou follow that thy mayest live, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So what is being practiced is a perversion of justice, is injustice and not the justice that God said that they would establish and would maintain and would enforce in the land that they were going in to possess. So that concludes the first section of our lesson, the first division of our lesson, 
Uh, and uh, so, so back is asking the Lord questions. He, he really is perplexed as to why the Lord, the righteous God, is allowing uh, all this unrighteousness to happen without any, with, uh, with impunity, with, without any judgment. And actually, uh, God actually answers him between verses 5 and 11, which is really not in our lesson text, but I think I need to read those verses quickly for context to put the, uh, the balance of our lesson text in the proper context. So let's read those verses quickly, beginning at verse 5. And this is God answering uh, Habakkuk. Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe though it be told you. Verse 6, for lo I raise up the Chaldeans that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are now theirs. Speaking of Judah's they are a, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed themselves. This is talking about the Chaldeans. Verse 8. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from afar from far they shall fly as eagles that hasten hasten it to eat they shall come for the violence their faces shall sup up as the east wind and they shall gather the captivity as the sand and they shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be scorned unto them they shall deride every stronghold for they shall heap dust and take it verse 11 then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend imputing this his power unto his god in other words the chaldeans are going to pass over the land and they're going to credit this utter destruction of it to their idol god so God has answered Habakkuk, and now Habakkuk is more perplexed than he was before. So our lesson text picks up at verse 12, and uh, from the uh, standard, the title of this section is Deliberations, from the quarterly, the title of this section is questioning God's plan verses 12 to 14 so let's let's read those verses and they are art thou from everlasting O Lord my God mine holy one we shall not die O Lord thou hast ordained them for judgment and O mighty, mighty God thou hast established them for correction thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he and maketh men as fishes of the sea as the creeping things that have no ruler over them and our key verse, by the way, is uh, verse 13b, which again reads, Wherefore looketh thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdeth thy tongue when the, when the wicked devour, devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? So now, again, Habakkuk is more perplexed than he was before. Uh, now he is wondering how God could use uh, a worse nation, a nation that is more deserving of judgment, to judge his covenant people. So let's back up to verse uh, verse 12, where he begins, verse 12a, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God? 
mine holy one, we shall not die. So what's he saying there? He's, 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 he's acknowledging his eternality and he's calling him my holy one. Uh, and this is the only place that this, this occurs where he is referring to him as his personal God, his personal holy God. But let's back up. He first says from everlasting, O Lord, we notice that O Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps means Jehovah, the self-existing one, the all-powerful one, creator and sustainer of all, all of that's in that name, mine holy one, we shall not die. In other words, he, he knows that God is not going to destroy his covenant people utterly. He's not going to uh, uh, allow them to be utterly destroyed as a people by the Chaldeans because uh, then God could not keep his covenant that he'd made with Abraham. Part B of 12 says, O Lord, again, Lord, all caps, thou hast ordained them for judgment and almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. What's happening here? So Habakkuk is really acknowledging God's decision. I mean, he's still having a problem with it but he is acknowledging that God has ordained uh, the Chaldeans to judge his people, okay? Uh, in other words, he's given them the authority. He is, uh, uh, he's predestined them and given them the authority to do that. He said, oh, mighty God is acknowledging God's power. And this word mighty is translated uh from a word that means rock, I mean, implying uh, firmness and security, uh, changelessness. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, God has proven to be firm and faithful and consistent. But again, this judgment is, again, perplexing. We'll see. We'll learn more about that as we go farther here. But he is he's acknowledging that, number one, in this verse part, or actually part B of 12, that God is going to use the Chaldeans. He's ordained them, but also his people. He has established them for correction. They are going to be corrected. They're not going to be utterly destroyed, but they are going to be judged. Now, even though Habakkuk is acknowledging God's decision to correct his people, uh, he's still having a problem with the manner in which he's correcting them or it's going to correct them because it doesn't really match his character to some degree. It does not match God's character. Uh, and, and we see that in verse 13a where he says, Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil and canst not look upon iniquity. Now, so he was he was really complaining about the evil and the and the wickedness that he saw in Judah, knowing that God also saw that wickedness, and he questioned why God was complacent or God was uh, ignoring it, or apparently ignoring it, and not judging or doing something about that wickedness. And now he, as, as we'll see again in a minute, uh, he is uh, really. Uh, certainly uh, aware that God is uh, aware of the wickedness, the even greater wickedness of the Chaldeans. Uh, they are a ruthless people, and we saw how God described them uh, in uh, that uh, those verses that were not included in our lesson text between 5 and 11, how they were uh, f fierce as evening wolves. Well, evening wolves are, are, are ravishing. They're ravished because they sleep during the day, and they come out early evening to hunt, and they're starving. So they're they're very fierce. And these eagles, he's talking about vultures uh, wanting to feed. You know how they flock on uh, carcasses. Uh, and so he he's compared the Babylonians to to just just beasts, just animals. And so God certainly knows about their iniquities as well. And He's saying, your your eyes are pure, and you can't behold evil. And so what does He mean by that? I mean, God certainly sees evil, 
But what is it? What does he mean? He can't. He can't look on iniquity. He really means he can't look on the iniquity without action, without doing something about it, without doing something to correct the evil. He can't tolerate the presence of any kind of iniquity again without doing something about it. That is what uh, what is believed he is saying here. And then part B of 13 says, Wherefore looketh thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdeth thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. And I'm going to read that uh, <clears throat> from the NIV for a little greater clarity. Uh, he says, why are you silent? Let me just read the whole 13th verse. Uh, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when wicked, when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than them? So he is looking ahead at how God is going to use the Babylonians or the Chaldeans who are more, and by the way, we can use those terms synonymously, uh, how he's going to use the Chaldeans to judge his people and they are more wicked than his people. Uh, he is saying, you know, how can you tolerate this treachery? And uh, uh, why are you silent, you know, uh, while the wicked swallow up those more righteous? So, so, uh, even though God has not done this yet, uh, you know, God, God's word, God calls those things that are not as though they were. He knows if God says he's going to do it, it's done, you know, for all practical purposes. So he knows God is going to do this and he's not going to dissuade God from doing it. But he's, he's, quite, he's again, he's confused as to how God is going to use a more wicked nation than um uh, than those that are being judged. Now, later, we know that God reveals to him that he is also going to judge uh, Babylon. Uh, he, he did the same thing. Uh, he told Jeremiah the same thing through Jeremiah. Uh, he prophesied about the seething pot that was boiling and about ready to spill over on the Judah. That was Babylon. But he, he says, but he also told him that he was going to judge Babylon as well. So uh, and let's, let's just keep in mind, you know, God is the only one that knows the ending from the beginning. Uh, we may uh, think that we understand the situation and understand how uh, things should be remedied. Problems, evil, violence should be remedied. Those problems should be remedied. But God knows the best way. And God is going to uh, basically uh, hold everyone uh, to account. And we know in this sin sick and dying world even, uh, because God is perfectly holy and perfectly just, uh, uh, we know that all sin is going to be paid for. We're either going to pay for our sins ourselves. Those who commit habitually throughout their lives, sin are going to pay for those sins themselves, themselves rather, throughout eternity, or they're going to accept the payment made for them, uh, and that being uh, by the shedding of the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go on to the final verse here, which is, And maketh men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. So what's he saying there? Um, what, what he's, he's basically saying that they, your people, your covenant people, are going to be made as helpless as schools of fish. OK, um, uh, you know, if if you uh, are a fisherman, uh, you more more than likely and you're not a commercial fisherman, obviously, more than likely you use a rod or you use a pole and and you, you catch one fish at a time, hopefully. But um, in those who are commercial fishers uh, couldn't survive that way. So they fish where there are schools and, they, and fish have a habit of 
of, of actually traveling in schools, in large flocks, if you will, with no leader. Uh, and they're, and they're basically stupid. They're just out there saying, catch me, catch me. And a fisherman with a net, just drag a net can, can envelop scores of them, dozens or scores of fish at a time. And they're virtually helpless. So he is comparing the helplessness of Judah uh, against the Chaldeans to schools of fish or creeping things, of course, which God gave man rule over the fish of the sea and the creeping things of the earth. He gave man rule over them. Uh, what Habakkuk is saying, you're basically giving the, the Chaldeans rule over us like you gave the first man, like you gave mankind rule over all the lesser creatures. And we are helpless against them. So, you know, what what what, what can we say in summary? Uh, God does not give uh, Habakkuk the answer that he expected or the answer that he wanted. God uh, gave him uh, his he gave him probably more than he even needed to. Uh, he told him how he was going to judge. He didn't have to explain why he was using a more wicked nation than the other, just as he didn't have to explain to Job uh, why he allowed him to suffer such things. As a matter of fact, if you recall, he began to ask Job questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And and, and, and where are what what is holding the earth up? And, and so forth. And questions that Job could not answer. We read uh, verses, I mean, Job chapter 38, verses 1 through chapter 40, uh, chap chapter 40, verse 2, uh, Job could not answer these questions. And so God does not have to answer this. Again, he tells us his thoughts are higher than our thoughts as the heaven is above the earth. And, uh, and we don't have to know why he does something. He simply wants us to trust him that he is always going to do what's right and what's best and because he is perfectly holy and perfectly just justice is going to be done in the earth uh, when the lord returns uh, he is going to set all things right he goes, he's going to destroy the enemies uh, of the lord with a two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth and that's not a literal sword that's the word of god and it is going to cut going and coming but if you read isaiah 55 89 again he talks about his thoughts being higher than ours. And so we don't have to understand. He simply wants us to trust him, trust his judgment, trust his righteousness, trust his holiness. And that's what Habakkuk eventually resigns to do as the other prophets that question uh, why God allowed the wicked to um to flourish. And we, we might ask that today, and I'm sure many do. Uh, they see people that are godless uh, in, 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 uh, in word and actions, uh, and they seem to be doing fine in good health and uh, wealth and prosperity. Uh, and then we, and on the other hand, we see many suffering saints. I, I remember when my, when my brother died and my brother was used powerfully uh by the lord in in leading many to christ i mean he was he was a a a, a powerful evangelist and deacon in our church uh and i and he he died of cancer uh, back in 1997 and i i I, had, I just caught myself questioning you know of all the deadbeats out there that are living lives that are not positively impacting anyone else's life. Why would you take someone from the battlefield that was doing so much for you, Lord? I had to ask him that, you know, and the Lord didn't have to answer me, and he didn't. But but uh, at least not directly. I think uh, from his word, you know, I and from reading Hebrews chapter 11, you know, the, the world is not worthy of some of those saints that God allowed to suffer before he called and I and I looked that way at my at my brother. Uh, the Lord had a right to call him home. He knew uh, what he was calling him from, what he was calling him to, and all that he intended for my brother to do on this earth, he had done. So, um, sorry to to uh, relay that that personal memory, but uh, it is something that uh, again all of us question from time to time: why the righteous suffer, 
and the and the wicked seem to flourish, but again, in the end, God is going to set all things right. You know, uh, God does not. Uh, uh, you know, the we when we reap what we sow, we don't reap the same day we sow. We reap later than we sow. So we 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 pray that you've gotten a, a little better understanding of this passage. And again, it's a common one. Uh, many prophets, again, have raised the same questions. We raise the same questions today. So, But we hope that we've gotten a little better understanding uh, of the fact that we don't have to understand why God does something. We simply need to trust him. So we pray that God will bless you and God will keep you until we meet again.